And I'd like to look uh, one more time at the parable of the sower. Hope you're not getting tired of this. Um, these different soils. But I was thinking about how, um, imagine if you were um, a, a salesman on the street trying to sell uh, maybe bananas or something like that. You could use a hundred different um, illustrations here maybe, but you're trying to sell bananas and you're trying to tell people how much better this is than the soda pop they're drinking and all that kind of stuff. And so some people, some people would just, ah, you know, I don't care about that. You know, soda pop tastes better, bananas. You know, I'm 16 years old. I'm this long life of 16, and I've never had a health issue. You know, what does it matter? Well, you know, it might be different if a 60 or 70 year old comes along, and you, he might be a little easier to persuade because he knows his friends have some health issues, and maybe it would have been better to eat bananas. But uh, so, so some people just wipe it away. Now that's like the the hard ground, right? The the seed that went on the hard ground, there's like no receptance to it. Harden your heart and walk away. Um, then there's some people that might say, oh yeah, that sounds pretty good. Uh, maybe I should try bananas. So they throw out their soda pop and they eat bananas until, you know, bananas don't really taste that great to some people and they get tired of them and the going gets tough and they go back to their soda pop. <clears throat> that might be the picture of the, the people on the uh, stony ground. It says there that they Received it joyfully immediately, but for some reason it didn't last. When things got hard, when testings and trials came, uh, they gave up. And not only did they just wither the, the plant, that actually just died. Never, never produced anything. The more dangerous one was the third one we looked at last Sunday. And here's the, the person that receives the bananas because they're good for him, and he keeps eating them, but he doesn't get rid of his soda pop. You know, he wants to have them both. And in the end, he's, he might be somewhat healthy. He doesn't die. No, it's not poison. He doesn't die. But he's just not the healthiest person he could be. I think that's a picture of what a lot of Christians are like in that third category. And that's why it's so dangerous. <clears throat> the first soil is the hardening. It's an unresponsive response. It's the response of unresponsiveness. The second one is, is a lack of continual response. And the third one is an is a, a lack of an undivided response. We want to respond to two different, we want to respond to the world, we want to respond to God. And interestingly, that plant doesn't die, the plant grows, the plant even gets flowers, the plant even gets a little bit of fruit on it, but it says that the fruit didn't reach maturity. maturity. And, and that's, I think, exactly what happens when people try to have a foot in both camps. So the fourth soil today is is the one we all want, right? It's the garden we all like. We probably all have gardens where some plants do better than others. And actually in Matthew, the, the parable of the good soil, it says that some plants produce 30, some 60, and some 100. Here in Luke chapter eight, it, he just says 100 fold. So I'm not sure if this was two different parables he told or if one just records one, one the other. But if it's true that the 30, 60, and 100 fold we're all pleasing to the Lord, which I think is probably the case, because I think in the parable of the talents, that's a similar situation. And because he gives, you know, the person that's supposed to produce 100, if he only produces 30, well, that's, that's a problem. But, but not everyone's given the same talents and abilities, <clears throat> same opportunities. And God is simply asking you to be fruitful in the seed that he has planted in your heart and, and to open up your heart for that water and that rain and that nourishment so that you can be fruitful right where you are. So in Luke chapter 8, I'm just going to read these couple verses again. Um, I think in Luke 8, verse 8, we have the, the, the uh, verse about the good soil. Others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then he goes on later and talks about how the you know, the Israelites did not hear. And so I think that's really what this parable is about. It's about how you hear. Hearing is responsiveness, and it's not just responsiveness, it's continual responsiveness, and it's not just continual responsiveness, it's an undivided responsiveness, and then it's, it's that's what's finally going to produce uh, the fruit here of this fourth soil. And then um, he, he explains this verse, or this parable, um, in verse uh, 15, <clears throat> The ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Now, back to some of these different things in the parable. The seed is the what? What was the seed representative of? 
And Jesus tells us that back in verse 11. That's the word of God. Uh, what is what is the uh, soil representative of? Hearts. A couple people said that, I think. I think it's representative of our hearts. <clears throat> So, you know, sometimes people say things like, uh, well, it's just the heart that matters, and, it's, and, and in a sense, that's true. The heart matters. But they also many times forget that what's coming out of the heart is showing that, that maybe the heart doesn't really matter to that person. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if somebody's going around uh, living in sin and doing things like that and says, oh, well, God isn't concerned about that. He's just concerned about the heart. Well, Jesus, Jesus said that's... Your mouth is telling us what's in your heart. Don't try to fool yourself and think that it's only the heart that matters. Let those things be a window into your heart, and you can know what your heart is. What's coming out of the abundance of the heart? The mouth speaks, the hands do, the feet go, the life lives. And yes, there are, there are times in life when maybe um, we, we make mistakes, and we get on our knees and repent. But I think we should look at, at the repetitive things that are coming out of our mouths, the, the things that, the patterns of our life. And let those be a windows into our in, into our heart. Which one of these soils are we? <clears throat> I like to think about about this heart. It says here that um, this was a noble and good heart. So think about this heart as being open and receptive to the seed, and then also um, having everything. It the, the soil was actually open enough that it received water, and it received all the nutrients that it needed to to support the life of this plant. And last Sunday I said, I think sometimes we, we maybe miss that part of the parable. The water, the sunshine, and all this stuff that God is so graciously just dumping out on all these four seeds. And some are receiving it and some are not. And we looked at 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter 1, where he says that God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And then he goes on to explain about uh, how these things should be added and we should add to our faith virtue and all those things. And interestingly, right after he says that, he says, if these things be in you and abound. You know what the word abound means? Somebody have a quick definition? Okay, multiply. Right, and it also means to be just full and overflowing. It's abounding, it's overflowing. So now think about about our hearts as turn to the Lord receiving. And as we receive the sunshine, the rain, which Peter tells us are all these things that he gives us, the exceeding great and precious promises, all the graces that he gives us, if, if our hearts are turned toward him and they're being filled up, if these things are in you and abound, notice what he says then, if you know your Bibles, by these verses by memory, they will make you that you will be neither what? Right, barren or unfruitful, and that's exactly what this parable is all about. Plants that were unfruitful. Because they did not receive the things that were already there, that God was already dumping out on them. And that's why Christians are unfruitful, because they're not receiving of everything that God is giving them. Their hearts are filled with other things, or congested, or they're not turned to God. They're either not receptive or they're receptive and then they dump it away, or they're trying to get water from two different sisters. <clears throat> um, recently saw a post of somebody, a picture, and I forget where this was, but you know, sometimes we, we talk about the optimist and the pessimist. The optimist, well, the pessimist says the, the glass is half empty. Well, what does the pessimist say? The glass is half full, right? But what did David say? He said, my cup runs over. So it's not good enough just to be the pessimist and say, the glass is half full. I mean, we shouldn't be satisfied with that either. David said, my cup runs over. And I was thinking about how in that Psalm 23, I think is where David said that. David had gone through a lot of difficult things in his life. He wasn't living on easy street where things were just, no, he had a very difficult life. We know how, how Saul was chasing him and hunting him down. And just a lot of things in his life just didn't pan out the way he thought they would pan out. He said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. But interestingly, he said that his cup is running over during this time. And why is that? Because David was a man after God's own heart. That means that David's heart was aligned with God's heart, and he had his heart turned like a cup toward God. 
and God could fill it. And these things were in him, and they abounded, and he was not barren or unfruitful. It didn't matter what kind of, where he was, right? He could be in the wilderness, in the cave, hunted down by men. He was not barren or unfruitful. <clears throat> Recently, I saw um, a post of, uh, of a news article about uh, Rick Warren, the, the man that wrote the, the book, uh, The Purpose Driven. He wrote The Purpose Driven uh, Life, what was it called? couple different books he wrote and he's the pastor of this mega church I think it's in California Saddleback Church and um, this church in Saddle, Saddleback is part of the Southern Baptist um, Convention or something they call it and anyway there was this there was this uh, debate about whether Saddleback could be part of the Southern Baptist because they were allowing uh, women pastors I think it was I think that was the issue women pastors which was something that the Southern Baptists do not accept and uh, Rick Warren made this statement. He said, why are we quibbling about secondary things? Why can't we just keep the main thing the main thing? And that's, I, I think, what so many people say sometimes about heart issues. They ignore, they ignore these things and call them secondary issues and say, why can't we just keep the main thing the main thing? And I'd be curious what you would think is the main thing. And, uh, you know, if we'd ask 100 Christians, we'd probably get, you know, 100 responses. What's the main thing? But some people say, well, the main thing is Jesus died on the cross. Well, maybe. Or the main thing is evangelize the world. Maybe. But I'd like to suggest to you that the main thing for us is, is something different. Jesus said, the first and greatest commandment is this. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second one, which is like unto it, is love your neighbor as yourself then you can go evangelize the world. The main thing I think that Rick Warren was talking about is like, why are we focusing on all this obedience when the main thing is evangelize the world? I think he had it wrong. I think, I think it's easy to get that one wrong. We think evangelism or, or you name it, whatever it is, is the main thing. But those things, yes, they're important. It's like one of the last commands Jesus gave. But that has to come out of something that's primary, first of all. And that is that... Our cups are turned to the Lord, that we're full and overflowing, and that we're abounding, then we will be neither barren nor unfruitful. When we can do all the evangelizing we want, if we're, if we're unfruitful Christians, it's not going to gain us anything. <clears throat> not going to gain anyone anything. So I'd like to think about turning our cups now as turning our hearts. Now, can you think of a verse in the Bible where it talks about turning hearts? Joel? Okay, what was the verse you were thinking of? Malachi. Yeah. Yeah. So I like to think about repentance as turning. And we sometimes think about repentance as just turning away from sin, and it is. But repentance at its very basic definition is just a change of mind and heart. God repented. He repented that he made man. He repented about other things sometimes. It just means he had a change of mind or change of heart. So when we say the main, keep the main thing the main thing, and that is that our hearts are turned to God, and when we preach repentance to the world, which was the main thing, I believe, in the book of Acts, repentance and turn to the Lord, that wasn't just turn from your sins, but it was turn your hearts to the Father. And that's the message Jesus said, that uh, he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. There would be this turning toward each other, and that's what repentance is, a turning toward each other. God has already turned his heart toward us, and he's waiting for us to turn our hearts toward him. And that's what we call um, intimacy. And people talk about intimacy with God, intimacy in marriage, you know, and sometimes uh, we could ask that question, what is intimacy? And I'm not going to go into that now. It's something I want to talk about some other time. But knowing each other in ways where there's nothing hidden from each other, no secrets, we get to know each other, that's intimacy. And we talk about an intimate relationship with God, and that can only happen when our hearts are in one direction, and that is toward God. His heart is already turned toward us. You know, think about repenting as turning. I'm not sure. I was looking for the etymology of the word repent because you have that R-E at the beginning, which means again. But I'm not sure if that means that in this case or not. But, but think about the word return. What does the word return mean? I mean, if you break it down in its, in its etymology, it means to turn again, right? So think of the prodigal son. He turned away from his father. But then he says, I will return. I'm going to turn back. I'm going to turn again. I'm going to back and have my 
heart aligned with the Father. So returning is repentance. <clears throat> so all these things that God is giving us, his sunshine, his rain, like in the parable, uh, all, the, all the things that pertain to life and godliness are the goodness of God leading us to what? What does the goodness of God lead us to? Repentance. He is trying to get us to turn our hearts toward him. He's like, and too many people picture him like the man with the bananas, right? You know, it's something I don't want. And Darwin has talked a lot about sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts. And, um, and I believe that would be maybe an example where, where people don't have a good understanding about the goodness of God <clears throat> leading them to repentance. I want to look at just a few more verses yet about the things that God is giving us, how he is showering his, his love upon us, and how we should be open to that. Um, some of my favorite verses are, and I've shared these before, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and maybe I'll just have somebody find that and read it, and, uh, and then maybe Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Do we have a volunteer to read uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, okay, Austin? And what about Ephesians 3, 20? Okay, Glenn. So think about how, how God, there's verses, and not all of these I'm going to read, but if God be for us, who can be against us? Here's, here's a verse that tells us God is for us. He is, his heart is turned toward us. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If our hearts are turned, our cups are turned toward him, and we have this intimate relationship with him, that's the greatest thing there can be. That's, that's the main thing. And Jesus also in John, the John 1, where he said, um, I forget who said it, but he said that talking about Christ, that he was full of grace and truth. But then he says in there, and of his fullness have all we received. These are the things that God is just showering out upon us. So now, how much of this fullness, how much of this goodness, how good is God really? Listen to these two verses. How good is God really? Um, Austin, you want to read? That verse, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, I think it is. All right, think of that. All, 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 all sufficiency, all grace. So that, and he abounds so that we can abound in every good work, right? He's given us all things. All right, that's how good our God is. And then Ephesians 3, 20. Right, and you may have heard me say this before, but exceedingly abundantly above is kind of a redundant term. So he doesn't just say it's above all we can ask or think, but it's exceedingly above all that we ask or think. But he says it's exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And that actually means it's above, well, to, I'm trying to remember how I, I had said this before years ago. I think it's the word abundantly means above and beyond. And so now he's saying he goes exceedingly, which is above and beyond, above and beyond, right, exceedingly abundantly above. So that's, that's the kind of God we serve. <clears throat> if these things that he wants to give you are in you and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful. If those things aren't in you, your obedience is just going to be legalism. And I was going to insert this in here somewhere, I forget where, but the definition, I heard a good definition of legalism that I, I'd like to read here, and I um, don't even know who said this. Legalism is a peculiar kind of submission to God's law, something that no longer feels the personal divine touch in the rule it submits to. I'll read that again. Legalism is a peculiar kind of submission to God's law, something that no longer feels the personal divine touch in the rule it submits to. It's kind of like we pull the law of God and separate that from the person of God. And so this person that said this, he said that we talk about antinomianism as lawlessness, that antinomianism actually comes out of legalism. So legalism is when your heart is not aligned with God and yet you obey, right? You submit, you obey, but your heart is not aligned with God's heart. You have separated that. But when you, when you do that, you start obeying because out of, out of duty or out of yeah, duty, 
And that eventually produces antinomianism. And so when somebody accuses a Christian of being a legalist when he is obeying God, that's not legalism. If his heart is in tune with God, in line with God, and he's obeying because of his love relationship with the Lord. So Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus said, If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. You cannot separate those two. All right, so <clears throat> I think I'm going to stop with that for today. Like I said, I would like to continue the study about intimacy and use marriage, the metaphor of marriage, to talk about uh, intimacy with God. And I think, I really think marriage is exactly that. It's a metaphor that we live out today to, to demonstrate what Christ and the church. And there's a lot of metaphors about the church. We have the kingdom, the king, but there's something about uh, the wife, the bride, a picture of intimacy there. And I'd like to uh, maybe delve into that a little more at some point.